as far back as anyone here can remember, fishing has been good in the Pacific. The ocean, almost a second home to the island people, has always provided food and income. Fishing is important in the Pacific, as important as life itself. Fishermen in the Pacific have always taken a pride in their catches. But right across the region, their stories have become increasingly pessimistic. It's not only the small-scale fishermen who are experiencing reduced catches. Commercial fishing operations in the Pacific confirm the downward trend. The size of the fish is getting smaller. Uh, the size of fish that's been brought in by the persainers look like it's been less. It took more days to catch. You know. Stories of declining catches and dwindling fish stocks may be new to the Pacific, but for decades fishermen around the world have been warning of an impending disaster. The world's oceans are in crisis. The demise of global fisheries has reached alarming proportions because of over-exploitation. According to recent reports from the United Nations, 70% of the Earth's fish stocks are either fully exploited, over-exploited or depleted. The causes seem easy to list, yet difficult to control. Too many fishing vessels are simply chasing too few fish. Rules and regulations have failed to take effect, or have not even been established. The result is a free-for-all on many fishing grounds. As a consequence, fisheries are collapsing, marine ecosystems are destroyed, and livelihoods are lost. Growing populations have led to an ever-increasing demand for fish. In an attempt to feed this insatiable appetite, the fleets of both the industrialized and developing countries have become bigger and bigger. Now that stocks in the most easily accessible regions are nearly depleted, the race is on to catch the ocean's last remaining fish. Fishing vessels now venture much further away from their home ports and coasts. With nets even reaching into the deep sea, they operate in the international waters and the polar regions where laws are either non-existent or unenforceable. In this chase for the last remaining fish, fleets from all over the world have set their hungry eyes on what's considered to be the planet's last abundant fishing ground, the Pacific. The Pacific Ocean, once considered too remote for many fishing fleets, has now become the world's most important area for tuna fisheries. 
50% of the planet's tuna now originate here. Every year, two million tons of fish are taken from the Pacific to feed insatiable foreign markets. This situation results in a serious depletion of Pacific fish stocks, but also deprives the Pacific Island states of a much needed source of income. Foreign fishing operations make more than $2 billion a year from their catches in the Pacific, but the island nations receive a mere 5% of the profits. While fish that once populated Pacific waters are being sold thousands of kilometers away, local fishermen are watching their catches dwindle and their earnings drop. This situation directly jeopardizes their livelihoods and the futures of their families. Tuna has become a huge international industry. Affluent Western nations have exhausted stocks closer to home and so now fly their tuna in from halfway across the planet. Sushi is a luxury for those who can afford it. But in the Pacific, tuna means life. In most of the Pacific Island states, fish is the only resource available and tuna is the most precious fish of all. Far from being a luxury, it's a crucial part of everyday life. Pacific fishermen are painfully aware of the causes for their own declining catches. They see the foreign vessels sailing on the horizon or fishing on the outer edge of the reefs, but they're powerless to stop them. <laughs> Nowadays, vessels from the so-called distant water fishing nations, which include countries such as Japan, Korea, China, the European Union and the US, can be found everywhere in the Pacific Ocean. They're fishing here either with or without a license. Longlining is a commonly used method that accounts for 8% of Pacific tuna catches. A longliner lays fishing lines of up to 100 kilometers in length with up to 3,000 baited hooks hanging at different depths. This method results in catching a good number of tuna, but also attracts and kills a variety of marine life such as turtles, seabirds and sharks. In the race to catch as many fish as possible, the crew often work in shifts to allow operations to continue around the clock. But more than two-thirds of Pacific tuna are caught through a method known as purse seining. Once a school of fish is found, a powerful small boat is launched off the big fishing vessel. It then circles the school with a net returning to the large seiner. The net is drawn tight or pursed at the base and hauled alongside, where a scoop simply empties out the large net. This method catches an entire school of tuna, along with all the undersized and unwanted fish that may have been swimming along with it. For the most part, the ocean is a vast blue desert. Floating objects such as this log provide a home and shelter to many fish and may develop into many ecosystems. Commercial fish species such as tuna will also gather here, and this in turn will attract fishing vessels. But not everything that drifts here is natural. A radio buoy floating on the sea surface indicates the position of a man-made device for attracting fish, an ingenious construction of logs and ropes. In their search for schools of tuna, Fishing vessels will home in on the radio boys they set out earlier or use helicopters to scout the surface. With this level of technology, no school of fish is safe from the nets. And because both natural floating objects and man-made devices attract mainly young fish, purse seiners often catch many undersized tuna here. It's different now. 
they even catch a small one below four, four, uh, four pounds, four kilos, I'm sorry. Especially the birds from the, from the Asia Pacific, they're going to catch uh, any fish. Sometimes we throw away a lot of, a lot of small size, you know. The wasteful practice of catching and then throwing away many undersized fish critically undermines the ability of fish populations to replenish themselves. But the purse seiners also catch a lot of unwanted fish and other marine life that is wasted as so-called bycatch. In the ocean, in the international water, uh, I don't think there's uh, a law. Uh, when there's a fish, there's money. Everybody wants to earn money for the company and for everybody because the crew are on tonnage. If they got no fish, they got uh, no money. Out here on the open ocean, there is often no authority to monitor the vessel's catches. And the prospect of easy money is a powerful incentive not to play by the rules. Pirate fishing vessels operate across the globe and have also found their way into the Pacific. These ships sail under what are known as flags of convenience of such countries as Belize, Georgia and Panama, making it easy to avoid rules and regulations. Because they fish without a license, the Pacific states receive no compensation for these illegal catches, while the pirates make fat profits elsewhere. Not only do the pirate fishing vessels ignore laws and regulations, they have no respect for the ocean's ecosystem, plundering whatever marine life they can find. Catching sharks simply to strip them of their valuable fins is outlawed in large areas of the Pacific, but the law is routinely ignored by the pirates. Often, pirate fishing ships will transfer their cargo to other ships on the high seas, out of sight of Pacific authorities. The large and unreported catches pirates take seriously contribute to the depletion of fish stocks and crucially undermine sustainable fisheries management. One way to deal with pirate fishing is by patrols that many of the Pacific Island states carry out in their national waters. But the loophole of the high seas and the sheer size of the ocean make it nearly impossible to patrol the Pacific effectively. And pirates have more than one way to get off the hook. The battle that we fight, if, we, if I use the term, is a battle against multinational companies. Uh, we have uh, a lot of resources, they got the best lawyers, they got a lot of money. You have to have the support mechanism from government uh, to support us, the people that go to the front line and do these jobs. But Pacific governments often lack the money to pay for petrol and spare parts, and in reality, many of the patrol boats rarely leave their harbour. Governments in the Pacific are not always doing the right thing when it comes to fisheries. Apart from the pirate fishing problem, fish stocks are already being overexploited by licensed operators. Lured by the prospect of big business and foreign revenues, governments often hand out too many licenses with little consideration for sustainability. Corrupt government practices mean that the people often get no benefit from income from such fishing licenses. Politicians who are decision makers are involved in corruption, so negotiation about fishing industry and other industries normally end up in under-table dealings, which is a corruptive practice. Attacked on two fronts by both licensed and illegal fishing operations, tuna stocks in the open sea are already showing signs of depletion. And the Pacific Islanders who depend on tuna are beginning to feel the effects. Well, if the tuna stock is collapsed, then the people will collapse. You, you go to any of the markets here, especially the fish markets, 
And what you find is people catching tuna every day and selling it at the market. People buy tuna to take home, which is part of their daily diet for protein. And the problem is coming closer and closer to shore. Pacific fishermen may depend on tuna for their income, but nearly all people depend on reef fish for their daily food. Now these two are becoming less abundant. These days, it's no longer only the foreign vessels that are fishing with industrial methods. Most Pacific nations now also have their own fishing fleets, often catching their tuna by pole and line. This fishing method depends on bait fish, which are caught on coral reefs. By night, these bait fish are lured into the nets of local fishermen in huge numbers. They themselves will be used to capture tuna the next morning. But the bait fish are crucial to the health of reef ecosystems, and their removal may have serious consequences. Now that tuna and other migratory fish are becoming scarcer, local fishermen will come to rely more on reef fishing. If the reef fish stocks also collapse, the effects on people will be disastrous. This is what's going to happen when the fish run out, because now like they change their style of eating to buy tinned foods from the shops. Uh, they, they buy rice. You know, their, their livelihood, they have to change it around. Like instead of eating fresh fish, they now rely on, uh, on, on thin food, which is not healthy, and it affects their health. Collapsing fish stocks and dramatic changes in traditional fishing methods lead inevitably to changes in island lifestyles. In some cases, the influx of foreign fishing vessels may also have more direct social impacts. There are times that we have shortage of fish because of that uh, big fishing boats. And not only that, but we also experience the changing attitude in our youth, girls' youth. That I hate to say it, but it's really happening. Like prostitution, you know, with the, especially with the crew. And the, the main impact that we are very afraid of is about our health. Foreign fishing operations are not only depleting marine resources, but now also directly affect the livelihoods and culture of the island peoples. The question now becomes, what can be done to reverse these negative trends? Many important fish species such as tuna migrate over large distances and take no notice of legal boundaries. And because fishing often takes place in international waters, cooperation between nations is crucially important for effective fisheries management. Some progress has already been made in the Pacific. The Forum Fisheries Agency was established in 1979 to unite management efforts by the Pacific Island nations. Since then, the FFA has created a positive register of ships that do adhere to the rules. It's also put into place a vessel monitoring system that allows fisheries authorities to track fishing vessels across the ocean. The role that is played by the agency is to coordinate and provide uh, uh, policy advices uh, to our member countries to enhance their capability uh, to be able to monitor uh, their own uh, their own economic zones. There is a huge gap that is uh, left unregulated uh, at, the, at, the, at the moment, uh, and this includes the pockets of ICs. The new Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission has been created to fill this gap. After years of deliberations, the Commission hopes to unite Pacific Island states to regulate fisheries on highly migratory fish such as tuna. Promising as it is, the idea is far from new. As far back as 1966, the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna was created. ICAT brought together more than 20 countries to regulate fishing for bluefin and other tuna species in the Atlantic Ocean. 
but its efforts to manage these fisheries sustainably have so far proved unsuccessful and Atlantic tuna stocks are in a critical state of over-exploitation. Consultant Don Alders has been closely involved with setting up the new Pacific Tuna Commission. Yeah, I've spent uh, 12 frustrating years at, at ICAT meetings and, and um, I haven't seen a great deal of progress over those 12 years in addressing the major issues with regard to conservation of, of the fish stocks. And it's mainly because of um, the difficult stand that some members take to protect their own industry. The new commission may be effective in closing the legal loopholes surrounding the high seas and help in the struggle against pirate fishing. But perhaps more importantly, Pacific governments must also seriously reduce the catches of licensed fishing vessels. It's obviously not sustainable to, to uh, have a large fleet of super saners continuing to fish in, in the Western Pacific. No, it's not sustainable. What is controllable is to have a, uh, a small fleet that involves some super saners fishing under strict licensing guidelines and strict reporting practices. That may be sustainable. Um, in order to really improve the situation here in the Pacific, the, the uh, Pacific Island nations have got to do a couple of things. One is to, to learn from other, other commissions. Uh, another is that uh, they've got to uh, continue, they don't have to learn, they have to continue to work together. Working together, sustainable and transparent governance and strict enforcement. All of these are vital to save the Pacific fisheries. But working together means involving more than politicians and policy makers. The people of the Pacific must be empowered to protect what is rightfully theirs. This will be an important challenge for the new Tuna Convention. I am sure when you go and talk in the rural areas, they don't even know what that convention is all about. And if there's something like you know, the law of the sea, the people would be 100% interested in it, or even more than 100% interested in it, because it is one of the resources they are very concerned with. I don't know There's an old story in the Pacific about a heron and a hermit crab who once crossed paths. Watching it crawling over the sand, the heron laughed at the hermit crab for being so slow. Insulted, the hermit crab challenged the bird for a race. The night before the contest, knowing that the heron would be faster, the hermit crab asked all his family members for help. And the next day, during the race, each time the heron reached a checkpoint, one of the hermit crabs was already there, tricking the heron into believing that his challenger had beaten him. And so the hermit crab won by being smart enough to count on collaboration. What worked for the hermit crab may very well work for the people in the Pacific. With threats to their future livelihood coming from all sides, they now need to forget their differences and work together. Only then will the Pacific Islanders be able to protect their fisheries for future generations. I'm <laughs> not